welcome to the Prophecy Club. We're going to switch gears today. We're going to be playing the audio of the Islamic Conquest. However, that is still part of an amazing deal that we have going for you. Here's what we're going to do. If you get one DVD, we're going to give you three more. This is really a great offer. I can just tell you that right up front. And if you don't get this, then <laughs> you are just missing out. Here's the deal. We are going to give you three free DVDs if you just get one. And what I'm about to play is part of the one that we'll ask you to get. It's called The Islamic Conquest. There's a lot of folks out there that are all tangled up about where the Antichrist is going to come from, who the false prophet is, and there's so much foolishness out there, I can't even believe. I don't know where they come up with this silliness that says the Antichrist is going to come from America. Well, book, chapter, and verse, please. It just doesn't happen. It's just not in the Bible. Okay, it's just not. Okay, so what does the Bible say about where does the Antichrist come from? All right, so that's the first DVD. Then we're also going to throw in Islam and Bible prophecy. That's my brand new DVD I just made here recently on Islam and Bible prophecy, where I go through having dug up all of the scriptures for you to show you all of the secrets about what's going to happen with Islam and Bible prophecy. In other words, one day, does Islam take over America? Is that where the beheading comes from? Uh, well, I explain that. Then... We have Bill Federer explaining Islamic conquest. He goes in and explains the background of the history on Islam, who they are, and if you know the history, then you pretty much know where they're going to go, right? Then one of my favorite, Israel, Islam, and Biochemical Warfare by Bill Sneblin. It's a wonderful DVD. You get four wonderful DVDs valued at 120 all for a gift to the ministry of just 30 bucks. That's right. Get one. And we're going to give you three free. And it's called the Islam Gift Offer. Now let's go on over and listen to the audio of the DVD by Scott Dreyer called The Rise of the Islamic Antichrist and False Prophet. And here's why you need to get it. There's a lot of people out there that think, oh, well, there's good Muslims and bad Muslims. There's moderate Muslims, and then there's radical Muslims. And there's other people that think having a mosque in their neighborhood is just being tolerant of other religions, just like we do with the Mormons or with the Buddhists. I mean, they're not going to really harm us. Most people think, oh, well, Muslims are not going to hurt us. Muslims are not all that bad, being a Muslim, having Muslims around. Is that true? Most people think think a mosque is just another church. Is that true? Let me just tell you, the greatest enemy for Christianity and Christians, well, I won't answer that. I'll just let you hear that from a person that really knows it. We're about to listen to Bill Federer. This guy's author of several books, and he's an expert on Islam, Muslims, what they believe. And I think you're really going to find this interesting. And you got to get the DVD set. Again, we're going to give you three free DVDs. If you just get one DVD, I'll tell you more about it at the end. I do want to mention that we are not concerned about moderate religious Muslims, right? Uh, moderate Muslims who are just religious are not a threat to our political system. But we are concerned about political and militant Muslims. And there is such a thing as political and militant Muslims, and we see how they have laws that govern behavior. Uh, whipping and killing, and in, D in Dira Square in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, they have uh, every week they chop off arms and legs. It's euphemistically called Chop Chop Square. And uh, here's a woman about to be stoned to death uh, and beatings, and a man beating his wife. In Islam, it says, Surah 434, that a man can beat his wife. Uh, Sharia law says to cut off the hand of a thief, and so they actually do this. And um, here is a political Muslim named Ajorm Qadari. He started a group called Islam for UK, and he stated, We request all Muslims in the United Kingdom to join us and declare we've had enough of democracy and man-made law. We call for a complete upheaval of the British ruling system its members and legislature, and demand full implementation of Sharia in Britain. So this is a political Muslim that wants to get rid of the laws in the country and institute Sharia law. And so we have uh, a problem. 
in America, we have laws that guarantee rights, and Sharia law wants to change that. Here is a political Muslim in Iran, Ayatollah Mohammed Tagi Mesbah. He's the spiritual advisor to the Iranian president. And when there was uh, some Muslims that killed Jews, and they were leaving the house, and they heard a baby crying, they went back in and slit the baby's throat. And the question was, uh, May 31st, 2011, was this okay? And he answered, suicide attacks are not only permitted, but a duty. And he said that killing Israeli children is okay. So these are political militant Muslims that do exist in the world, and they have an agenda. Now, there is the Muslim Brotherhood started in 1928 in Egypt. And it is political and militant. And they said that Allah is our objective, the Quran is our constitution, the prophet is our leader, jihad is our way, death for the sake of Allah is the highest of our aspirations. Now the dilemma is, is that we have a constitution in America, and they say that their Quran is the constitution. So which constitution are we supposed to go? They want to supplant their constitution. So we see, as more Muslims begin to move into Western countries, uh, democracy is cancer, Islam is the uh, answer, democracy brings oppression, Islam is the solution, uh, no democracy, just Islam, and uh, we see that they do not like the freedoms that have been um, used to people in, in the Western world. So uh, they want to eliminate the freedom of speech. Now it's important to understand, when Muslims conquer a people, the people they conquer are forbidden to insult Islam. And so when a people voluntarily agrees to say things that are not insulting, you know, agrees to limit their free speech so that they do not insult Islam, they are in effect surrendering to Islam. So it's not blasphemy laws, it's not freedom of speech laws, it is literally surrendering and acknowledging that it has just conquered. Uh, anyway, here is the president of Sudan. He says the official religion will be Islam and Islamic law the main source. And so we see that these Muslims in northern Sudan are persecuting the Christians in southern Sudan. And now we see that they started a group called Sharia for America. So these are Muslims that have a political agenda for our country. These are churches that have been destroyed by these political militant Muslims just within the last couple of years. These are churches in Iraq, Iran, Egypt, the Middle East, Kenya, Nigeria. So political and militant Muslims. Now the thing about Sharia law Islam is it doesn't need to be from the government. It can happen on a clandestine sort of vigilante type of level. And so uh, what the government does is they allow it to happen and when there is the call uh, to condemn it, they'll condemn it, but they'll never go out and try to find who did it. And that's uh, very similar to the Deep South in America. We're familiar with um, Lincoln Republican freeing the slaves, right? And the Democrats in the Deep South passed Jim Crow laws and black codes, which relegated the freed slaves to a second-class status. And if there was a lynching or a killing, the... Uh, a local sheriff would just happen to never find out who did the crime. And so there was this understanding that you could do the uh, very um, uh, racist and um, uh, intolerant actions toward uh, the African Americans, and the Democrat uh, uh, politicians would never find out who did it. Um, and uh, anyway, this is an illustration that I use because in Muslim countries to this day, uh, Christians and Jews are second-class status. They are a, a dimmy. And um, if a crime is committed against a Coptic Christian in Egypt, the police simply will never find out who did it. And this is the understanding that you can do a crime against the Christians and you never get uh, stopped for it. So again, this is political Islam. It does exist in the world. And um, it is contrary to the uh, values that we have in America. And so uh, here is a pastor in Iran, and he was sentenced to death for not converting to Islam. And after being in jail several, several years, uh, there was a, a large international outcry, and he just recently was allowed out. 
Uh, here is a girl, CBS News reported May 31st, 2011, where she was stoned to death for, for participating in a beauty pageant. And the murderer told the police that she had violated the laws of Sharia. Um, and then here's CNN reported May, March 29th, 2011. Uh, the, um, a 14-year-old girl was raped by her 40-year-old uncle. When the local imam found out about it, they ordered her to be arrested and whipped 101 times. She died after the 70th whip. This is Sharia law. It takes place in America. I mean, sorry, it takes place in the world. And it's starting to take place in America in different neighborhoods. So it first takes place in Muslim homes. Then it takes place in Muslim neighborhoods. And then on Muslim streets. And then in Muslim communities. And then Muslim cities. And then it ends up taking over. So it's um, a process. Here is a uh, April 4, 2012, an Egyptian court sentenced a 17-year-old boy to three years in jail for a Facebook posting that they considered insulting. And then it's coming to the West. Here is Canada, Kingston, Ontario, January 29, 2012. An Islamic Afghan man and a polygamous wife killed a co-wife and three teenage daughters, accusing them of being too westernized. And when the judge heard the case, he called it a cold-blooded and shameful murder, a twisted concept of honor. And then the Los Angeles Times reported an Oscar-winning documentary called Saving Face puts the focus on the plight of more than 150 acid attacks on Pakistani women every year. And so, ladies, if you were in Pakistan and you were not dressed with a veil or burqa, they would take it upon themselves individually to enforce Sharia law, and they would throw acid in your face. And um, you go to the police. Police basically don't find out who did it. This takes place in the world right now. And these are done. Why are these crimes done? They're done by political and militant Muslims. Um, here is March 14, 2012. The uh, Moroccan girl commits suicide after being forced to marry her rapist. 16-year-old Moroccan girl has committed suicide after a judge ordered her to marry her rapist. And it, it's, uh, the Moroccan Penal Code exempts a rapist from punishment if he agrees to marry his victim. So this is Sharia law. It takes place in the world. And then CNN reported, AC360, April 23rd, 2009, child brides lifting the veil. And so Muhammad's youngest wife was six years old when he married her, Aisha. And so there are Muslims today that want to follow his example and marry young girls. Now, in America, we have laws that are age of consent laws, right? And there's crimes for doing things with um, you know, children that are under the age of consent. Uh, not so in Sharia. And so this is something that takes place. Uh, matter of fact, I was doing a radio interview in uh, Vera Beach, Florida. And the uh, co-host on the show was... Um, uh, Laura Chafin, and she is uh, a retired actress. You may have remembered the Father Knows Best TV show. She was little Katie Anderson. Now she's grown, and she was living in a condo complex in Florida, and Muslims are moving in. And um, uh, she was interviewing me about my book on Islam, and I started asking her, and she started telling me stories. I said, well, well, tell us the story. And she says, well, Muslims move in, and she tried to be nice to the Muslim ladies, and one day a Muslim lady came to her door and said, I want to invite you to marry my husband. And she said, uh, you're married to your husband. She said, yes, but he's a Muslim. He can have more than one wife. And she says, well, I'm a Christian now. And, and she said, that's okay. He can have a Christian as one of his wives. And she said, no, really, I'm not interested. Said a month or so later, the guy comes to her door with a teacup and a saucer, and he's trying to muscle his way in and wants her to serve him tea. And she said, I knew enough from visiting with these Muslim women that if I fulfill the role of serving him as a wife would, he could claim me as a wife. <laughs> and so she said, I am not serving you tea. She said a month or so later, she sees the same man with a young girl in the neighborhood. And as she's walking down the sidewalk, she comments, oh, is that your daughter? And he goes, no, it's my new wife. Taking place in Orlando, taking place in Dearborn, taking place in Kansas City. Taking, I talked to a doctor in Kansas City um, and uh, the Muslim woman comes in. And if there's something, she says, oh, you need to bring your husband in, you know. So she brings the husband in. Another Muslim lady, oh, you bring your husband in, she brings in the same man. Another Muslim woman, she brings in the same man. All right? And um, then um, we see that in many, uh, talk to someone with the Health and Human Services, 
It says that more Muslims are signing up for welfare. And uh, the breakdown of the home has facilitated the introduction of Islam. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, it's normal now to have a woman in an inner city with no husband and kids and on welfare and food stamps. The Muslim men are coming in, setting up their harem. Each wife gets their own apartment, their own place, and they all get food stamps and welfare. He goes around and collects the money and impregnates them. I was recently in Detroit, and uh, a man came up and he says, yeah, um, uh, more Muslims are moving into the neighborhoods. The property values go down. And, and Faiz Fazl, my neighbor, he bought the whole block of streets, and he has one of his wives in each house. And the kids get out, and they play, and they're really noisy. And he goes, ah, I'm thinking of moving out, you know. And so we see this is happening. And the police don't want to do anything about it because they don't want to stir up a riot. They don't want to get in there. The sheriffs don't want to do anything. They don't want to, you know. And so we see this is uh, Sharia law. It's political and it wants to change the laws, and it's moving west. Anyway, so the religion of Islam is fine, but political Islam is not fine. What do I mean? Religion of believing uh, what you're going to have in paradise, you know, if you want to believe there's 72 virgins up there, that's fine, that really doesn't Im- impact me. Uh, if you want to pray five times a day, fine, that doesn't really impact me. And if you um, uh, want to pray in a certain direction, fine, that doesn't really impact me. As long as it's your beliefs, that's fine. But when it turns into laws and you wanting to make everybody else give up their freedom of speech so as not to insult you, and then you want to have women be treated a certain way, and then you want to practice polygamy, and then you want to have uh, lower the age of consent and have minor... And, and then in Sharia law, the man divorces the woman, but the woman can never divorce the man. All the man has to do is to say, I divorce you, she's out the door. You know, she can never get alimony, she never see her kids again. And, you know, and so these are laws, and so that is not okay. So the religion of Islam is okay, but politicalism is not okay. And I know I got your wheels turning, but we're going to go through this. So what is happening today? Well, past behavior is the best indicator of future performance. You want to hire somebody for a job? How did they do on their last job? So we want to know what's happening today. We look at the past. So if I was going to pitch a stock investment and I said it's a really good stock, you'd go home and check out the track record. Well, if I'm going to pitch a religion say it's real peaceful, you can go home, better yet, by my book, <laughs> and you can check out the track record. Well, we just happen to have 1,400 years of track record. So there's really no mystery as to what we can expect. So 1,400 years, and uh, one of the terms being used a lot today is Arab Spring. What is Arab Spring? Well, there's actually been three springs throughout Islamic history. The first Arab Spring was from 622 to 1071, right? Uh, the Arabic Uh, capital of Damascus, and then it switched to Baghdad and became more of a Persian. The second was a Turkish spring, went from 1071 to 1923. And the third Arab spring began in 1928. And so we see these are political and military expansions. So let's look at the first one. This is the world 20 years before Muhammad was born. This is the Byzantine Christian Empire, right? All of Italy, Christian. All of Greece, Christian. All of Turkey was the Byzantine Christian Empire. All seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were all there. Um, And uh, all of Syria was Christian. Syria was the first country to completely be Christian, evangelized by Paul. And Antioch, Syria was where the name Christian was invented. (laughs) And uh, then, of course, Jerusalem had been a Byzantine Christian city since Constantine. For three centuries, Jerusalem was Christian. And Constantine's mom, St. Helena, went down there and looked for the places where Christ's passion took place and built cathedrals. And then Egypt had been Christian for six centuries, evangelized by Mark that wrote the Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And um, then there used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa in the 7th century, right? And this is eight centuries before the Reformation. And so we see that this was the world in the West. And this is 550 AD. This map is 20 years before Muhammad was born. So this empire began to be challenged by an empire on the East, Persia. Now the Sinassanid Persian Empire begins to take over the Middle East, begins to take over Syria, begins to take over Jerusalem, begins to take over what is today Turkey, begins to take over Egypt. And so we see this is the East. So the East versus the West, sort of like the Cold War with the U.S. versus the USSR. Back then, it was the Byzantine Empire versus the Persian Empire, right? And they both beat the tar out of each other and created a power vacuum, 
and Islam was able to conquer very quickly because both sides had depleted their resources and had tens of thousands of their soldiers dead, and so they were very um, vulnerable. And so Arabia. Arabia was sort of like the wild, wild west, ruled by gangs, tribes, nomads, and that is where Muhammad was born. So Muhammad's father died before he was born, and he was born in 570 A.D. His mother died when he was six years old. His grandfather and guardian died when he was eight years old, so he was orphaned and taken in by an uncle, Abu Talib. Now, all this information is in uh, the book, What Every American Needs to Know About the Quran, A History of Islam in the United States, and there is lots of information, so it might be hard taking notes, but uh, Muhammad's father died before he was born. His mother died when he was six. His grandfather and guardian died when he was eight, so he was orphaned and taken in by an uncle, Abu Talib. And Abu Talib was a merchant who would go on camel rides to different cities, and he would take Muhammad along with him. And they would go to different cities and hear about the different religions, pagan religions, Zoroastrian religions, Jewish and Christian. So um, Muhammad uh, was 25 years old, working for a wealthy widow. She was 40 years old. Her name was Khadija, widowed twice. And so she decides to marry Muhammad. She's 40, he's 25. And now he does not have to work. And so he's in a cave outside of Mecca in 610 A.D. And he's visited by a spirit. And the spirit squeezes him and commands him to read. He said, I cannot read. The spirit squeezed him again said, read. He said, I cannot read. The spirit squeezed him a third time and said, read. He said, I cannot read. Finally, the spirit threw him down and he began to recite. And that's how the Quran came to Muhammad. He'd get these verses in his mind, would repeat them until he had them memorized. And then he would teach them to his followers. So the word Quran means recitation. It is an oral thing because Muhammad and all of his original followers were illiterate. And you think, well, how can somebody that's illiterate memorize all these verses? Well, today we have kids that maybe can't read in school, but they can memorize these long rap songs. Well, in Arabic, these verses had a little rhyme to them. And so we see that in Arabia, they had over 360 different pagan gods. And the most popular was the moon god and uh, Hubal, the moon god. And... um, They were Canaanite gods, basically. So the fertility gods in Canaan were Baal and Ashtaroth. Baal was the male god associated with the sun. Ashtaroth, or Esther, or Easter, that was where the name came from, Ishtar, that was the female god. And so you had Demuz and and, and these different Babylonian names, but they were usually a male god and a female god were were the male main deities. In Arabia, it was sort of switched, and the male god was the moon god. And so these pagans in Arabia, every town had its favorite pagan god, and so that was the Allah for that town. And since Mecca was a big town, the Allah for Mecca was Hubal, the moon god. And their calendar began with the first sight of the crescent moon over the desert. And so that got incorporated into Muhammad's belief system. And so we can even see, here's a scripture from the book of Judges, uh, and it talked about Gideon slew the kings Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the crescent half-moon ornaments that were on their camels' necks. So the idea of, you know, the crescent and, and, and it was associated with the pagans and so forth, that is something that was there at that time. Now they had this rock they thought had fallen from the moon. It was a glass impact rock where a meteor hit the hot desert sand and melted it. And uh, these pagans would kiss this rock and bow to this rock and walk around this rock. And Muhammad kissed this rock. So this got incorporated into his belief system. Now, it was uh, destroyed in a fire and, uh, you know, centuries back. And so they took what was left of it and they wrapped it in a, uh, a frame of silver. So that's what you see there. And that rock was kept in a building called the Kaaba that housed over 360 different pagan gods. And so all these pagans would once a year go to this square building and worship their different pagan gods and walk around this square building and so on and so forth. And um, anyway, then there were the Persians, and the Persians were Zoroastrian. And the Zoroastrians believed that paradise was filled full of virgins that would fulfill all the guy's desires. Muhammad heard this, and it got incorporated into his belief system. The Zoroastrians also believed in genies or jinns. These were spirits that followed you around for good or bad. Matter of fact, uh, the word genius was not somebody with a high IQ. It was somebody that had a jinn or a genie follow them around and tell them all the answers. So then so next time somebody says, you're a genius, you can say, no, I just have a high IQ. Um, 
Then there is the Manichaeism. Now, Mani was somebody that lived a couple centuries before Muhammad, and Mani combined a little Buddhism, paganism, Judaism, and Christianity. And uh, from his point of view, he was extracting the truth out of these different things. And it was popular. Matter of fact, one of the followers of Manichaeism, before he rejected it and converted to Christianity and spent the rest of his life debunking it, was none other than St. Augustine. Okay, I hate to have to interrupt him. As you can tell, he's got some really good stuff. But I want to tell you about this offer. You really want to get this. Here's the scoop. If you get one DVD from us, just one, we're going to give you three other DVDs. <laughs> Last time I checked, that's really, really good, okay? Here's the deal. If you get the DVD you've been listening to, it's called The Islamic Conquest. And in this DVD, Bill Fetter essentially shows you over a 1,400 year the patterns that Muslims and Islam follows. And by knowing their past performance, you can know what their future actions are going to be. So if you want to know the truth about Islam and what Muslims do and what they're going to do in this nation, this is your DVD. Then we're going to give you my new DVD, two hours and 40 minutes, Islam in Bible Prophecy, also Islamic Conquest by Bill Federer. Bill goes through and helps you to understand the history of Islam and the, where they're really going. I mean, that's what it's really talking about. And the rise of the Islamic Antichrist and false prophet by Scott Dreyer. And essentially, it's making a case for where the Antichrist and false prophet come from. And then Bill Sneblin's Israel, Islam, and Biochemical Warfare. So we tie it all together. You get four DVDs valued at $120, all for a gift to the ministry of just 30 bucks. And of course, coming off of the summer slump, we could frankly really use it. So uh, what we'd like you to do is call 785-266-1112. That's 785-266-1112. Grab your cell phone and call in and get the Islamic gift offer. A gift of $30 gets you four DVDs. Really, really, you'll be well informed on Islam and what's going on. Four DVDs, and you can also go to prophecyclub.com and just click on the Islamic gift offer. you got to call now, 785-266-1112 or prophecyclub.com. Now, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for listening to this radio program and thank you for your prayers and your gifts of support. God bless. Now from the Prophecy Club, some exciting opportunities for you. In the hidden partnership of America and Nazi Germany, Doug Woodward tells the story of how America immigrated tens of thousands of German Nazi war criminals after World War II who set up the modern eugenics and mind control programs that today are causing the wild shooting rampages like we saw in Aurora and Newtown. In today's plot to make men God, Doug ties the American and German eugenics programs to modern transhumanism, the incursion of angelic DNA into the human genome, meaning an injection to fix your DNA. It is the extraterrestrial tampering of the human genome producing an alien-human hybrid body for the Antichrist to occupy and cause the strong delusion. Get both DVDs valued at $60 in the Woodward gift offer for a gift of $40 or more. Remember, Prophecy Club continues because of your prayers and gifts of support, not the distribution of DVDs. There are 30 scriptures in the Bible which say in the last days massive amounts of oil will be discovered in Israel and we believe we've been given the directive to use this prophesied oil and gas to fund worldwide soul winning. If you have questions about our vision, call 877-OIL-ISRAEL or 877-645-4772.